Welcome to Spill the Ink, a podcast by Reputation Inc., where we feature experts in growth and brand visibility for law firms and architecture, engineering, and construction firms. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, everyone. It's Michelle Calcoat King here. I'm the host of this show and also the principal and president of Reputation Inc. We're a public relations and content marketing agency for professional services firms including law firms and architecture, engineering, and construction firms. We understand how sophisticated buyers find and select professional services firms. For the past 10 years, we've helped firms grow through thought leadership-fueled strategies, including media relations, bylined article placement, blogging, email marketing, video marketing, social media, and more. To learn more, go to rep-inc, that's inc with a K, dot com, or email us at info at rep-inc.com. So our guest today is Mark Wainwright. He's the founder of Wainwright Insight, and he partners with growing small and mid-sized professional services firms in part-time consulting engagements to manage their sales pipeline and coach sales team members. So thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Michelle. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this because it's a it's a very relevant topic right now. Um, you know, uh, ten years ago, sales it wouldn't even be mentioned um, when talking um, with professional services firms. So let's let, let's first start uh, about uh, tell me a little bit more about your firm. I did that kind of brief intro, but tell me about why you founded it and and, and what you do. Sure, thanks. I. Uh... Uh, I started this uh, practice that I call fractional sales management about four or five years ago. And uh, that was after uh, 15 plus years of working with and for professional services firms of all types, management consulting, architecture, engineering, et cetera. And I just un- came to understand a need for someone to come alongside practitioners who needed to learn how to sell better, not get between them and their clients but just guide them, advise them. So I started this practice and I, I bill myself as a part-time sales manager for part-time salespeople. And I consider architects and lawyers and everyone you mentioned there, um, part-time salespeople in their professional right. services firms. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting double role they have to play. So uh, why is sales kind of that uh, dirty word often in professional services? Firms? Right. Uh, you know, and, and I don't know if we've exceeded the, the, the regulations for an explicit podcast yet or not, right. but uh, yeah. people, yeah, it's, we've used sales a lot. And I think maybe your marketing audience is starting to tune out, but we'll reel them back in. Uh, yeah. I think that, um, you know, here's the thing about sales. Uh, you know, nobody likes to be sold, but everybody likes a sale, right? Right. <clears throat> People hate selling, but they love to buy, you Mm -hmm. know? And so in in, in firms, we don't, in a lot of professional services firms, most don't have salespeople, but they have these people called doer sellers. And that's completely kind of recognized and understood and embraced, right? So so we we have a little bit of confusion with this, this term sales. And I think sales is kind of living through this decades old hangover uh, mm-hmm. that we have yet to kind of work through. Sales has fundamentally changed because buyers have many, many more choices and they have much more yeah. information now. So yeah. that if, you know, if they run into a, a buying selling situation uh, that they don't like, they can simply choose to go a different direction. So, right. you know, sales has changed uh, a, a good bit in the last, you know, 30, 40 years or so. Yeah, yeah, it really has. And how, you know, I, I work uh, with professional services firms doing um, something complementary to sales, but, um, you know, often we're running into the, well, you know, it's just referrals. We just, uh, you know, uh, we just do good work and the work comes and, um, and, and yet they're, they're still stagnating and um, sort of helping firms understand why, yes, that might be the case years ago. And why it's not going to be the case going forward is difficult. How do how do you approach that situation? Because I'm sure you hear the same. Sure, I, I you know sales is uh, you know, and this is a funny word. I think sales is very empowering because it lets you really decide the future of your firm. It lets you do more proactive activities that let you um, 
fill your pipeline and the work that your firm is undertaking with the types of clients you want to work with doing the type of work you want to do. So yeah. I think there's a real power in, you know, having a, a, a strong sales engine inside your organization. Yeah. Yeah, that's a um, fantastic point about um, you being proactive and you deciding on the kind of work you want to get and and building those right. uh, those processes and that expertise in order to get it. Um, so, and I think that that would speak uh, to a lot of professional services firms owners who who want to direct the future. So why so why is so beyond that point, which is a fantastic point about, uh, you know, really kind of controlling what kind of work you get. Why is sales necessary today? You mentioned that it's very different. Kind of walk me through what's changed. Well, the, you know, like I mentioned before, the, the, the uh, amount of choice that buyers have is, uh, is, has exploded. Mm -hmm. uh, and information is widely available to the point where buyers often have more information than the sellers do because they're aware of the competitive environment and they've done yeah. their research and homework and, and everything else. So, Sales has radically changed there. But what happened with all of this information and this choice is that buying has become harder. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not, we're not just talking about sales being a challenging thing for practices to undertake. Buying is harder. So yeah. the reality is, is that both parties are in a bit of a cloud, in a bit of a fog, right? Yeah. Where it's unclear and ambiguous. So firms have to have kind of an organized sales process so that they can take the lead in the buying selling relationship and that they can help be a guide, right? Yeah. So, because it's really, really hard to buy and sell these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I always liken it to uh, when you were saying sales is more difficult to, or buying is more difficult. It's even, even in our personal lives, you know, the amount of research we can, you know, rabbit hole we can go down for something we would have just walked into a store and bought whatever was sitting on the shelf. And nowadays we'll take, you know, I know my, my partner is guilty of it, you know, five hours to figure out what lawnmower to buy. So, right. Yeah. right. It's so, it, it's, it's so true. And, and, you know, to, to deny the, the influence of our personal buying and selling processes, you know, mm -hmm. what we go through in our own heads when we're doing something as a consumer to deny the fact that that has significant influence over the professional business to business world is, is, is naive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So walk um, our um, listeners uh, through the difference between sales and marketing and also business development. Um, explain those differences, because not everyone's clear on that. Right. And, you know, I, I don't have a silver bullet and, 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 and I'm not going to clearly, I'm not going to give three really beautiful, concise definitions. And, and I think there's still a lot of confusion out there. Yeah. What I like to do is sort of go through the Venn diagram exercise where, okay, in this circle, I know there's a whole bunch of things that marketing does, right? There's right. a whole bunch of activities that marketing does. And in this circle, there's some sales stuff. And there's not a ton of overlap between the two. There's obviously a connection and a need for those two to be tied together, but there's not a ton of overlap. Marketing is more promotional in, in, in nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sales is is not uh, marketing is is more uh, one to many activities and sales is more one to one activities. Mm -hmm. David Meister, who wrote the book Managing the Professional Service Firm, uh, thirty years ago, but it's still it's still a really popular book, uh, refers to them as broadcasting. Marketing is broadcasting, and sales uh, is courting. And I know courting is kind of a funny, you know, decades old term, but there is a difference uh, yeah. between the two. The weird one is that business development term. And I don't know if that's another circle that touches both, if it wraps around the whole thing, which I don't think it does. But I know that there's things that, that marketing folks in professional services do that sales don't. And I know that business development, people who have that title might do a little bit of marketing and maybe do a little bit of sales, but I know they don't do certain things in sales and I know they don't do things in marketing. So maybe we're dealing with three circles that kind of intersect to some degree. Oh, that's so funny the way. Yeah. It, it, well, then if you start talking about outbound versus inbound marketing, mm. you know, I had a client uh, describe yesterday to me, uh, he, his, his uh, uh, definition or the way he described marketing was like providing air cover for sales. Um, and I thought that was an interesting <laughs> way of, uh, of talking about that. I always say, you know, marketing to me is 
the activities you do so that when you do land that sales meeting, uh, buyers have a better understanding of who you are and what your value proposition is. Yeah. Um, so, and then of course, in, in many organizations, marketing is delivering leads up to sales to kind of, right. you know, right. take it over. So it kind of, it depends on what that marketing mix is and how you're, how you're doing that. But yeah, um, it's interesting that you're breaking out sales and, and business development. Um, I would, I've always used those as interchangeable. So, right. Uh, and it's, it's, it's absolutely common practice to do so. And, and I'm not quite sure that's, uh, I'm not quite sure that's the case because I know a lot of people who have that title or had that title, but they didn't undertake specific sales mm-hmm. activities. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so, so they're, so they are, so they are a bit different. And the, the last thing I'll mention about, about marketing and sales is that marketing um, is not completely promotional, but it's much, yeah. it's, it's more promotional, right? Mm-hmm. Sales conversely, it's not l- completely lacking that promotional stuff, but it's, it's far less, maybe it's, you know, 90, 10 versus 10%, 90%, that sort of a thing. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when you think about it that way, if marketing's largely promotional and sales is largely not promotional, then you start to think about what is, what is sales? So if it's not Mm -hmm. promotional, then what am I doing? Because a lot of the things that I start to see in proposals and other things that firms create are kind of promotional in nature, but I think that's, that's off the mark a little bit. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me, um, cause your model is a fractional one, meaning a uh, part-time, um, but you also, uh, place emphasis on working alongside the, uh, professional services providers, the seller doers. Tell me why that is. Right. Well, the, the, um, the approach is designed to be client centric in mm-hmm. that in professional services firms, the clients want to be working directly with the practitioner. And they don't want someone in the middle of that relationship. So I come alongside, but I'm never in between. I'm never involved in those conversations. Um, I try to prepare practitioners leading up to those conversations and then get together with them afterwards to sort of see how things mm. went and what was learned and, and, and mm. did, they, did they stick to the agenda that we had put together, et cetera. So I'm always alongside, and that's a little bit different of a sales management approach than other industries. There are sales managers out there that you can kind of picture likely bad ones that you're picturing in your mind that you know they find out that their salesperson isn't doing a good job so they sweep in and kind of close the deal right they mm, get in the middle yeah. of that 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 relationship but I don't do that at all um, mm-hmm. I'm just alongside the practitioner so I help guide and prepare and coach them both individually and as sort of teams and groups but I also help firms uh, develop a really kind of rigorous sales function, which includes a, you know, a a good quality sales pipeline and sales processes inside the organization that help move opportunities from, you know, a maybe to a contract. Can you give me a couple of examples of uh, what are the things you're helping? You you talked about processes. Um, What are some of those processes? Give me, give me a picture of what that looks like when you uh, start working with a firm. Sure. There's, there's, uh, we do a lot of planning. Uh, mm-hmm. And and uh, these aren't strategic plans that are a three ring binder that get stuck on the shelf to to you know gather dust. Um, you know the 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 planning that I love and I think that a lot of my clients really help really appreciate are those little small sort of micro plans, the little like and I call them call plans um, mm-hmm. that help uh, an individual prepare for a high stakes interaction. I think too often we show up for a conversation thinking that oh we're just going to wing it we're fine I don't really know what yeah. the agenda is I don't know what I don't know what questions to ask frankly I'm not really clear about what my ultimate goal here is yeah um, so if they can come into those situations more prepared mm-hmm. then their confidence increases so their likelihood of success, of success increases that's what it's all about it's about yeah. introducing skills going through processes to in, to, to increase confidence and increase the the likelihood of of successful outcomes. Are you also helping them because you you talked earlier about uh, being more uh, you know proactive in the kinds of clients? Are you also helping them think through what kind of work do we want to get and identifying those prospects? And are you doing any help with? Uh, you know, I don't. There's very few professional services firms that I know that have sort of an outbound approach to their right. sales. Um, are are you working with firms on that? 
Yeah, the the both from an from an account a client account basis and also sort of a market segment basis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, when when if you have a long term relationship with a client account and you want to grow in importance to them, I mean, the term I the term it's used in sales is called share of wallet. Maybe you've worked with them for a while, but your share of wallet is small. Maybe mm-hmm. their annual spend you only have five or ten percent of that on your services. Maybe you yeah. want to increase that to twenty or fifty percent then mm-hmm. there's things that you need to do in a proactive fashion in order to increase your importance to that client. Maybe it's yeah. new services that they didn't know you offered. Maybe it's just new relationships that you need to build with you know, other geographic offices, other business areas, you know, whatever it is. So you can, you can develop client accounts and grow in importance to them uh, with intention, you know, with plans and with some proactive activity. When you grow in market segments, uh, mm-hmm. you, you tend to want to do so in a very focused way. So we figure out what specific expertise do you have to offer to a larger marketplace that maybe they're not familiar with. And then you can go do outreach in a very, very targeted sense, making a very specific offer that puts you kind of in the, in the, in the experts uh, seat. So yeah, we focus on both, both growing with existing client accounts, offering multiple services. But then when we want to grow market segments, we focus in on a narrow expertise and grow sort of strategically that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can imagine that's very valuable uh, for firms. So let's talk about the actual people that you're working with. And I, I had read, uh, I always prepare for these podcasts by kind of digging into some of the stuff that my guests write. And I saw you had sent out an email and it, in a couple of questions you were prompting were like, what make, what, what's it take to be a good salesperson? You know, does this salesperson, do you, do, you know, and most professional services providers aren't um, what I would consider uh, your typical, what we all, what the, the accepted idea of what someone who's good at sales are. So how do you help clients understand what being in sales is about and what makes a good salesperson? Right. I, um, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier that, you know, the, the, if, if the buying selling process uh, these days it's difficult because there's so many choices and so much information out there. And then there's kind of a fog out there. Mm-hmm. So a good salesperson is the guy, right? So that mm-hmm. means that they have to, they have to be helpful uh, mm. and they have to, to, to put forward a, a, a good, rational, thoughtful process that helps buyers move through their buying process and help sellers move through their sales process till, till everyone you know, comes to a kind of a mutually beneficial situation. So I try to emphasize that rather than, you know, all these other things that people talk about, about being, you know, pushy or, uh, you know, just whatever, you know, historically salespeople have kind of been known as, is Mm -hmm. it really, you can't be pushy. You need to be a guide because this is a confusing situation for everyone. And if you start to bring clarity, um, you know, setting expectations, coming up to meetings, using an agenda, following Mm -hmm. up properly. you know, making sure that you've got clear next steps defined between these different conversations that are all part of the sales process brings more clarity to the buyer and, and, and makes them start to think, oh, well, these guys are going to help us move through this challenging process. So, I mean, really, that's what it's about changing. And, and, and it's, it sounds so simple, but there's such a huge mindset shift between you know, what everyone has thought from a legacy standpoint of what sales is to what it needs to be now, which is helping. Right. Yeah. Helping. And that, uh, that my, I don't want to answer a question for you, but, um, you know, I saw that you talked about you're working alongside seller doers. So you're not coming in and saying, I'll take this function off your hands. Right. You know, I'll go away and do this for you. Um, tell me, tell me why this is. I, I mean, I can, I, I, I'm going to guess that it's because it's become such a helping process that it's kind of, it's critical to have their expertise of the actual services. Right. And, and, and it's, you know, the, it's, it's, it's client centric because that's what the client, the client wants to be working with the practitioner, particularly in professional services where things are complex. You know, the mm-hmm. services off, offered require a high level of expertise. So you can't have a, a, um, a non-expert in the conversation, even early on, really, because very early on, there's a, there's a, a, a large amount of subject matter expertise required in these, in these conversations. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so it's it's that it's having the practitioner always lead the the conversations and the other thing is that 
what a lot of firms find themselves, the situation they find themselves in is that maybe they were started by a group of entrepreneurs that had, you know, various business skills and some of them uh, uh, maybe are, are, are good, at, good at selling, good at revenue generation, et cetera. But when that second and third generation start coming along, those aren't people that were hired to, you know, go sell. That was the founder's mm-hmm. purpose, right? That yeah. was what, that was their role. But now 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later, whatever it is, they have to turn back around to their firm and look across all of their, their you know, great employees and think, who's going to be our future sales leaders, right? So, mm-hmm. so this is, and, and, and I talked to so many firms that this is their situation is that they have a group of, uh, of founders or maybe even just senior leaders that have been there for a while. Yeah. And they, they, they are running a deficit in sales acumen across the organization because for too long, they've focused those responsibilities on just a few people. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the hope is, is that when we introduce skills, increase confidence across the firm, that those future sales leaders will start to step forward and the senior leaders will say, well, this is great. We've, we've got an, an, a wealth of, of, of skill uh, across our organization, people who are ready to take on this responsibility. Yeah. Interesting. It's, uh, it's very similar to uh, what we do um, in the content side, which is you know, I think many years ago, firms would hire, if, if they did it at all, you know, an agency, an ad agency who would go away and create ads or collateral or, you know, this kind of thing. And it was sort of like hire them and get it done, you know, and the kinds of marketing that has to be done now really has to involve those uh, subject matter experts. We can't put out great content um, that speaks to buyers' needs without, you know, tapping into these people's brains. I use a term a lot called knowledge extraction, and I borrowed it from somebody. Uh, I didn't come up with it, but um, you know, I kind of talk about that's a key. That's what we're doing regularly is kind of pulling that knowledge out of them and then creating that content from there. But it just it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing anymore. It's uh, which increases these people's uh, complexity of their jobs. So right, it does. Know, I can kind of it understand does. the frustration of that. Yeah, there's a there's there's a, a a lot of responsibility, a lot of things to do for everyone inside of these firms, particularly with smaller firms, because yeah. you know you don't have the luxury of sort of spreading out all these responsibilities across many mm-hmm. many people. There's a lot of people wearing a lot of hats, mm-hmm. uh, and and that is that is 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 so true. My my hope is that um, particularly when I work with individuals, uh, that they can make more efficient use of the limited time that they have available to do this type of work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and things like creating proposals that take hours and hours and hours. Maybe we can start to limit that time and refocus that time into other areas that are maybe more effective and more productive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's part of that's part of uh, one of the puzzle pieces in my in my work. Yeah, interesting. The other thing I saw you write about was uh, helping firms shift from a vendor mindset to more of a trusted advisor. One is that do you see that as a, a problem in a lot of firms, kind of a more vendor mindset, um, and and how are you helping them, you know, make that shift? Right. That that's you know accuse accuse any skilled professional services practitioner of being a a, a, a vendor and you're you're liable to get you know socked. Uh, but you know when when professional services firms week in and week out, you know, continue just receive requests for proposals or requests for qualifications. That's how buyers buy vendors. That is how they do it. Mm-hmm. And that it, and, and it's not, it's really for the most part, those buying processes are not really healthy buying selling situations because really mm-hmm. sellers and buyers want to get to know each other because chances are pretty good they're going to be working together for a long period of time. They want to make sure that they're compatible. They want to make sure that their communication is good. They want to make sure that um, they can develop a, 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 a high level of trust and mm-hmm. kind of understand that they have each other's back, right? Mm-hmm. And those prescriptive buying processes don't allow anyone to establish that. So yeah. they are flawed buying processes. They are how you know large organizations or municipalities buy all sorts of things, not, you know, not the least of which is like business machines and office supplies and things, right? right. It's just, right. It's, it's, it's not a, it's not a productive way to start a long-term relationship. Um, but shifting to a trusted advisor means that the client 
the, the I'm sorry, the consultant needs to understand the client's business far deeper than they likely do currently, which means mm-hmm. that they need to invest the time and energy to do their research, to have conversations, to work through difficult challenges that might arrive in the working relationship. Hey, we kind of ran into that problem, you know, a month ago, we don't think it was mm-hmm. resolved. What can we do to kind of make it better? They have to know their long-term plans. They have to know what they're, what they're doing. And they have to understand why is the client doing all of these things? Like what are their, what's their big, what are their hopes and dreams? What are their goals? Yeah. Right? yeah. So as, as, as consult, as professional services firms, professionals um, shift more to that mindset, we start moving towards that place of trusted advisor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, um, that's very true. Um, and, and I see it. Uh, yeah, I see that time and time again. The last thing I wanted to um, ask about was, you know, you kind of talk about making this process of winning new business less uncomfortable, um, you know, confusing and uncomfortable. And um, that kind of uh, spoke to me because, uh, um, you know, I think I think that's a big reason why a lot of firms kind of or in a lot of professional services providers stay away from it because it just, you know, it feels ick um, to them. What are ways to, to, to approach it so that you aren't ever doing, you, you don't get in that situation? Right. And that's a, it's a great sort of summary question because we touched on a whole bunch of things that, you know, if sales is in fact helping, um, mm-hmm. then that's the mindset set shift is that, is that um, we can, we can shift from, you know, being pushy, man, manipulative, whatever terms there are to just being helpful because we understand that buying is difficult. Mm-hmm. And as a, as a, as a, as a uh, more skilled practitioner who is getting better at this whole selling thing that we need to be a guide and we need to help mm-hmm. kind of move them through a, a process. So that's one way that you can help both parties become more comfortable um, and make the process less, less confusing. Um, you know, and then there's all the little details of, you know, all these little micro interactions of, you know, preparing for these important conversations, having a clear agenda that isn't a forced agenda, but just lets everyone understand what to expect in these, in these conversations. Yeah. And then following up really clearly with a detailed understanding of everything that you heard. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's not, oh, you know, you talk about this and by the way, here's three paragraphs of why we're great at it. It's not that at all. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's um, just reflecting back to them, everything that you heard, right. It's that, it's that, um, it's that going out to dinner situation with a large group and the server comes and takes everyone's orders and, you know, two are, you know, need to make, you know, gluten-free substitutions or there's other little things happening. And the server doesn't write any of it down yeah, that's and so- you're freaking out. Everybody's yeah. just like, what is happening here? And then right. all of a sudden yeah. the server moves around the table and locks eyes with everyone around the table and says, you got this and this, and this is what you'd uh-huh. like. And I think that's a lovely choice. And move around. And, this wave of comfort and relaxation uh-huh. comes across everyone. It's a great, now it's time to enjoy the evening. Right. Yeah. So, so, and that's, that's an, an, an odd parallel, but it's not unlike what, what a skilled buyer can do. A, a skilled seller can do with a buyer who's a little bit confused is give them a good process, constantly reflect back to them what they heard and what they understood, you know, mm-hmm. and constantly advance this opportunity to the point where both are really comfortable, both are confident, both there's some good trust that has been built. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully it ends up successfully for, for everyone. So, you know, that's, um, that's it. And, and, and I think that once technical professionals, architects, engineers, lawyers, you know, and anybody else who's used to working, you know, in sort of maybe that left brain world starts to get their head wrapped around the fact that sales can be rational sales can have a process and it and and it's fundamentally based in this sort of you know mindset of, of helping um, uh, then they can improve yeah it's a uh, it, I use the same analogy when I talk to younger people about networking you know if if you because um, I never I always hated networking I couldn't stand going to events and not knowing anyone and you know I, I you know if you flip it on your head and you just think how can I help the people in this organization? 
you know, and you find those committees you can serve on, you know, suddenly you're networking like a pro, but it's, a, it's a different, you're not walking up in a party with a drink in your hand, you know, making that cold introduction anymore, you know, people, cause you've helped them out. And, um, uh, there's a, a, a guy who runs a, a, a company, um, and I'm going to blank on the name. It's a huge content marketing agency. Um, and he put out a book and, and I bought it excited. And half the book is just about helping people, mm, you know, yeah. and it was, uh, kind of enlightening to me. I always knew, but you know, if you take that approach to most everything in, in your business life, um, you're going to, uh, you're going to see. So. I totally agree. I yeah. Totally agree. yeah. Interesting stuff. Well, thank you so much. This has been very fascinating. Um, uh, very relevant. I'm hearing it from a lot of my clients. Um, it's a, it's a real shift happening right now. So you're, you're definitely in, in a good spot. So if people want to learn more about you and, and what you do, where should they go? Great. Yeah. I have a, a hopefully informative website at wainwrightinsights.com. I'm sure we'll link to that um, yeah. somewhere. They're welcome to just connect with me on LinkedIn or any other place that I'm, that I'm uh, hanging out. Uh, it's been a, it's been a pleasure uh, spending some time with you and it's, and it's ultimately my hope to, to, to help people who, who practice marketing to be able to, you know, define and do their marketing better because sales is, is more clearly defined in, within organizations as well. So I, Absolutely. I it's, it's, it's my hope to be able to, to, to help both of those sort of functions and organizations run better. Yeah. Exciting. All right. Well, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for listening to Spill the Ink, a podcast by Reputation Inc. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.